want to shift gears a little bit and um, talk about something uh, that uh, we all uh, find important that we see in our our patients that uh, come to clinic and also what we see in the um, primary care practice community um, sort of some um, barriers and bias in uh, recommending bariatric surgery to patients and how that affects a uh, patient's opinion about bariatric surgery. So this was, I was inspired to kind of um, revamp this talk that I gave to uh, the family uh, practice physicians by uh, the first time that Dana and I, um, and Dana will be talking to you later, the first time we saw a patient uh, together, Dana came in and uh, presented the patient and said, you know, I'm, I'm really worried about this patient. She, uh, she's just really depressed about being here. Um, she just uh, um, is really uh, ashamed to be here and, um, and is, is tearful. And, and I, I spent uh, some time talking with Dana about how often I see that in our patients. And some of the things I hear people say um, to us is, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe I get, let myself get to this point. This is so humiliating. To keep in mind, though, that uh, the patients that we see have been battling their weight for 10, 20, 30 years or more. They've been on every diet there is. Um, they're riddled with guilt and shame and frustration and the, many of them see resorting to surgery as a culmination of this lifetime of failure with weight loss. Blame, self-loathing, and often tears are a part of uh, most patients' first visit with us, and I would put it to you that no one deserves to carry this around. So I told, I told Dana, I don't let anyone leave our clinic without talking about this. This is what I say to our patients. You've been on a lifetime of diets. You've tried them all. You have amazing willpower. Many of our patients have lost 100 or more pounds and unfortunately gained it back and then some. But these are the tools that are going to go along with surgery to make sure that patients are successful. And I say to patients, why should you be ashamed um, by wanting to guarantee yourself something that diet and exercise have failed to give you? Um, for Isaac mentioned that patients who have more than 100 pounds to lose, only about 3% of them are able to lose that weight and keep it off, whereas about 75% of patients who have bariatric surgery are able to do that. And we haven't figured out any other way that is safer or more effective for patients that have that amount of weight to lose. So in, in, um, in many ways, medicine hasn't figured it out yet. We, we have a uh, one solution that we know works and, and that's surgery. So why should you um, uh, be ashamed of giving yourself every chance to have a longer, healthier life? And I'll talk a little bit about what the results are after surgery. And I tell patients, and I told Dana to tell this patient that when uh, you leave the office, I want you to leave blame behind. It doesn't help any, uh, anyone, it doesn't help you succeed. And choosing to do surgery is not the easy way out. It's just the safest and most effective way. So this is just a reminder of where we are today. The percentage of, of American adults on a diet in 2010 was 54%. That percentage has probably increased now. And <coughs> current, the current uh, data from this year is that 38% of adults are obese. Look at how that goes along with the value of the diet market in 2010. This is in billions of dollars. We're talking $60 billion made by the diet market. Something's wrong with this picture if 38% of adults are still obese. I would just want to go through some things uh, uh, that a lot of people might not know about uh, uh, the risk of obesity versus the risk of surgery. Uh, Dr. Samuel talked to you about some of the um, obesity-related uh, comorbidities here. Type 2 diabetes, very common in the patients we see, um, as is uh, hypertension, GERD, heart disease, sleep apnea. Annual obesity-associated mortality, uh, 112,000 excess deaths due to cardiovascular disease, 15,000 excess deaths due to cancer. A lot of people don't realize the relationship between cancer and obesity. 
35,000 excess deaths due to non-cancer, non-cardiovascular disease related to obesity. Keep in mind here some of these statistics. Obese individuals have a 10 to 50% increased risk of death compared to individuals of a healthy weight. Let's talk a little bit about the cost. Direct obesity-related healthcare spending, this is from 2013, costs $147 billion per year and represents 10% of medical spending. Loss of productivity isn't something that's um, talked about a lot, but uh, disability due to obesity is very costly to our economy. And obese individuals spend 40% more on their health care than individuals of normal weight. Let's look at the risk of surgery. We've seen some of the risk of obesity. The risk of death from bariatric surgery is about 0.1%. Well, we saw the risk of death from obesity is 10 to 50%. Overall likelihood of major complications is about 3%. And uh, we've already seen that the risk of living with morbid obesity far outweighs these risks of surgery. If you look at the, the cost of, uh, I put an example here of a lap laparoscopic ruin y gastric bypass. Um, is around twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars, most covered by insurance companies. Uh, this is pays for itself in two to four years' time by decreasing the amount of of healthcare spending. So, Dr. Samuel shared with you some of the resolution in uh, comorbidities, but imagine uh, uh, patients being able to be off their diabetic meds, and this is something that happens very early on after surgery. Uh, very good results with re resolving sleep apnea and getting people off uh, CPAP. And uh, an increased life expectancy. Uh, this is just a, a nice uh, observational study that's very simple to understand. It's a simple design. They, they divided people who were morbidly obese into a group that had surgery and a group that didn't have surgery and they followed them for five years. They uh, saw at the end of five years an 89% decrease in the uh, risk of mortality, risk of death in the group of patients that had surgery versus the patients that didn't. And in those five years, they saw 50% more hospitalizations and a 45% higher direct health care costs in the patients who did not have surgery. And remember where, um, where these categories come from and remember what the risks are of staying obese. For, for death uh, in the obese category, one, uh, men are 1.5 times more likely, men and women 1.5 times more li likely um, to die from their obesity, twice as likely to have um, heart disease that causes uh, um, heart attacks, one and a half times more likely to have stroke, five and a half and seven and seven times more likely to have diabetes than patients of a normal weight, um, and the list goes on. But um, having said that, only 2% of patients who are eligible for surgery are ever referred to see us, and um, I started lo looking into why this was when we know it's so safe and effective. And I, I think uh, I've come to the conclusion that there's old information out there about the safety and efficacy of of uh, bariatric surgery, and you've seen here that it's very safe and the most effective thing for um, to treat mor morbid obesity and its related diseases. I think there's a continued bias, uh, not only in society, but also in medicine uh, towards patients who are obese. And I think that there's a stigmatization of, of having failed at, uh, at diet and exercise. Mm -hmm. And um, I think primary care providers, uh, uh, and this is a generality, um, uh, don't um, want to address weight with many patients, and um, they still feel that bariatric surgery is a drastic measure, a last resort. Uh, this is a study, uh, just a survey of primary care physicians, um, and, and this is just a quote from the study here in bold. Physicians felt treating obesity was futile and significantly less effective than treating other conditions, hence many avoided addressing or treating the problem in their patients. Well, this, um, this is not okay because uh, we've seen huge differences in people's quality of life and the length of their life. Um, by directly uh, addressing the problem of obesity versus all of the related conditions. 
I just want to give a couple of examples. I think everybody likes, you know, a good before and after to see real people's results. And so all of the patients that we share today are our actual patients. Uh, this was a patient of mine who came to us with very uh, difficult to control diabetes on a huge amount of, of insulin and other medications. Her BMI was 46. She was on uh, home oxygen uh, for asthma um, and a variety of other medications. These are her six month results. She went from a BMI of 46 to a BMI of 32. Now this particular patient, I was able to stop all of her diabetic medications in the hospital. She never needed any more diabetic medications because of the hormone changes that come along with the gastric bypass. Her hypertension improved, she was no longer requiring oxygen, and all of her other medications decreased. This is uh, um, just a quick uh, calculator that I found online in, on the American Heart Association website to see what, what patients' risk factors, uh, patients with diabetes and, and obesity, what their risk factors are. And so I just plugged in one of Dr. Samuel's successful patients. He was a male, he was 35 years old, he was six foot one. He had no pre-existing heart conditions. He was 33, so he had had, uh, when his diabetes was diagnosed, so he had diabetes for two years. He didn't smoke. He rated his level of physical activity as low. At the time we met him, he was 322 pounds, and his hemoglobin A1C was 12%, so his diabetes was very poorly controlled. He had high blood pressure, he had high cholesterol, and he had low good cholesterol. I plugged his numbers into this calculator. These were his preoperative numbers, and it calculates a risk here. Risk of heart attack in this 35-year-old man was 70% uh, in a 10-year period. Risk of stroke, 6% versus the general population with, uh, with good parameters here. So he was 70% uh, versus 4%. I plugged in his numbers nine months later because that was uh, uh, what we had at the time. So his blood sugar, hemoglobin A1C had gone uh, from 12 to 6.7. Blood sugar was much improved, cholesterol much improved. Look at his 10 year risk of heart attack went from 70 to 5%. Risk of stroke went from uh, 10 to 1%. So these are real patients, these are real results. And I would, I would suggest that patients are been, being denied access to the single most effective treatment for obesity and obesity-related disease because of blame and misinformation and bias. Bariatric surgery is not a last resort, and it's the most effective and safest treatment that we have today. A little bit later, you'll get to meet uh, one of my patients. Um, we're very grateful she could come uh, here today, Brenda Martsky. Um, she had a gastric bypass about a year ago. She's lost a, a total of about 75 pounds. Um, she has sleep apnea, GERD, uh, a difficult, difficulty with activity uh, when we met her, and um, she'll, she'll let you know um, uh, more of her story when we talk later. Right now I'd like to introduce uh, Dana Jones. She's our um, uh, new uh, advanced nurse practitioner, and um, she'll talk with you next.